I'm here to talk tonight about reclaiming the American dream. Um, and to me, that really means restoring the middle in America, restoring the middle of the middle class and restoring the middle in the uh, political spectrum. Because if you look at Washington today, it's conquered by and dominated by extremes, uh, and we can't move forward. It's interesting, I got thinking about the middle, and if you go way back to a fellow named Aristotle, it's interesting, people were there way back, you know, we think it's real history if you go back before 2009 in American journalism. <laughs> today. Um, but if you go back to Aristotle, he says, thus it is manifest that the best political community is formed by the citizens of the middle class and that those states are likely to be well administered in which the middle class is large and stronger, if possible, than both of the other classes. Now, as I travel the country and as I look at the polls, that's not what I see and that's not what I hear and that's not what you see and that's not what you hear. It, it is astonishing to me that since this book came out, Who Stole the American Dream, that practically every week there is new information that informs us that the country's in trouble and the middle class is in trouble. Uh, literally uh, about 10 days ago, the Commerce Department reported that uh, as a share of the national income, GDP, corporate profits were at their highest percentage in 85 years. And at the same time, the share of GDP that goes to people's pay, and we're not just talking about workers' wages, we're talking salaries, we're talking everybody's pay, is at the lowest level in 65 years. That the corporate tax rate in America effective real tax rate, not what's in the books, but what companies actually pay, is at its lowest level in 80 years. It's just a little over 20%. The official corporate tax rate is 35%. That tells you how much gets written off with all kinds of loopholes, of $1.2 trillion worth of loopholes a year. And uh, that the corporate tax share of all the tax revenues going to the government has fallen from about 7.8% in 1945 to 1.3% today. So when we're hearing from corporate America that it is under pressure, overtaxed, we know that historically speaking, that in fact that is not true compared to our own past. This is not compared to communism, socialism, Europe, whatever, it's just America's own past, okay? Um, people sense that there's something wrong about that. You see opinion polls that say repeatedly, uh, Americans think that, uh, that the distribution of income in this country is unequal, that the rich are making too much money. Um, and yet it's very interesting when, when political scientists actually give Americans a graph of the distribution of income. They don't tell them what country it is. And they show them what the actual tilt of the income is. That almost, well, the, the great majority of Americans think that the American economy looks like Sweden's economy which is much more uh, equal or much less unequal than ours. And they don't even rate the economy that's way off here to the right. A couple more numbers, I don't want to burden you with a lot of numbers, but from 1979 to 2011, out of all the growth in the entire nation's growth in income, 84% went to the top 1%. It's just staggering. Citigroup, which is hardly Paul Krugman and all those liberal Keynesian economists, Citigroup put out a report in 2005 to its wealthiest clients, recommending that they invest in the companies that cater to the top 1% or 2%. Tiffany's, companies that produce luxury yachts, jewelry, uh, companies that build homes in gated communities and so forth, because that's where the purchasing power in America was concentrated. And then they went on to say, that the world has not seen a degree of inequality of income that is existing in America. This was in 2005, by the way, before the downturn. Hasn't seen that in any major economic power, and we're not talking about underdeveloped countries, since 16th century Spain. It's 500 years. So whatever it is you think you're seeing, it's a heck of a lot worse. <laughs> I'm serious, and, and that, that's, it, I'm glad you laughed, but it's really not a joking matter. I have to tell you, I spent the last 30 or 40 years of my life covering issues like this. And when I did the research for this book, I was astonished practically every week, certainly every couple of weeks. 
by what I discovered because the situation was so much worse than I had imagined it was. Now, I suppose partly that's because I remembered that there was a time, at least in my life, when I thought that prosperity was shared more widely in this country, that the fruits of the growth of the economy were shared more generally among the population. Um, you know, when I came out of college in the mid-50s and then in the 60s and 70s, I thought it was shared more widely. And I thought, Rick, you got white hair now, and there's a great tendency of people with white hair to say, you know, back when I was a boy, when I was young, all the women were strong, all the men were handsome, and all the children were above average. Everybody was above average, right? When we were young, everybody was above average, right? So I said, you better go back and check. Well, here's what I found out. I was right. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> it's a good feeling. Um, I, what happened was, from 1945 until the mid-70s, the productivity of the American workforce, which is the engine that generates the growth in li of the economy and, and the rise in living standards, it roughly doubled. It went up 96.8%. And the median household income, the income of the people in the absolute middle, the belt line of American society, rose 95%. 96.8 and 95. Almost dollar for dollar, the gains in the economy were passed through to the people in the middle. They were shared widely. And even further, what I found was economists like to cut us up in the quintiles, the top 20%, second 20%, all the way down to the bottom. And what's interesting, over that long three-decade period, the average income in every single one of those quintiles rose. They rose together, almost like a chorus, almost like a you know, musical score with those lines running parallel with each other. Ups and downs with the um, uh, rise and fall of business boom and bust, the business cycle. But they moved together. And what's really interesting is the average incomes in the bottom two quintiles moved up a little bit faster than the middle, and the incomes in the top quintile move up a little bit slower. So we had a little bit of a convergence. Not much. I don't want to overdo it, and I don't want to suggest that pay was equal then. Charlie Wilson, who ran General Motors, largest corporation in America, best paid American CEO, uh, made about 35, 40 times the pay of the average General Motors worker. By the way, interesting, you might, might be interested in this, his pay was $600,000 a year. Adjusted for inflation, that would be $5 million today. $5 million, he hardly noticed the guy. I mean, he, he's, he's not even in the competition at $5 million. You know? So that tells you something about something going out of whack between then and now, okay? So we all moved up together, so that, 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 was, that was true. And I thought, and, and then I also remembered that, yeah, Johnson and the Democrats and Kennedy fought like hell against Nixon and Eisenhower and the Republicans, <laughs> but it was amazing. Do you know they actually pass budgets every year? <laughs> now, if we pass a continuing resolution, we think it's a hallelujah moment. It's, it's, it's kind of like seeing a comet in, in, in the skies. It's so rare. When you pass a budget, you have to pass 13 appropriations bills. They cut the, they cut the, budget, the government up into 13 slices. They did this every year. And they passed Medicare and Medicaid and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and they sent somebody to the moon and they confronted the Soviet Union in the Cold War. I mean, look at all the things that got done. We had a bipartisan political system that people fought, disagreed, and then sat down, voted, and when the House and the Senate disagreed, they had a conference committee, they actually got together, and they worked it out. So the difference then and now is enormous. Now the next question in my mind was, how the hell did we do it? How did it work? Why did it work so well? Well, one thing that is very important for today to understand, and that is that one of the most important ingredients of the success of American democracy and the success of American small-d democratic capitalism was people power. We had strong movements among the body politic at the grassroots. We had civil rights movement. I covered the civil rights movement. I, I met Martin Luther King in Albany, Georgia, and covered him in Birmingham and Gadsden and all over the South, pushing the boundaries of American democracy to try to include blacks. And then the Voting Rights Act, which was important. We had a women's movement. Betty Friedan, feminine mystique, 50 years ago said, you know, it's not fair. Women are getting paid 41 cents on the dollar for doing the same work as men. They have to do something about it. <laughs> what they did about it was 
baffled most of us men. Some of them went braless. We didn't quite know whether to be teased and delighted or upset. And, you know, we did not have, we did not know how to cope, but we absolutely we knew something was going on. Let me, <laughs> let me, it got our attention. Let's put it that way, right? And then, you know, Kennedy in 1963, he signs the first pay legislation that, that, that outlaws pay uh, discrimination by gender, pay discrimination by gender. So, and, 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 and we're not there yet. By different accounts, it's 70 cents on the dollar, 77 cents on the dollar. Another accounting says 84 cents on the dollar. Women are still not at, at parity, but they're a lot better off than they were. And you can thank those people back there at that time for that. And then, you know, can you imagine back in the early 60s, a guy named Ralph Nader wrote a book, Unsafe at Any Speed, and what did he say? American automakers are making cars with defects in them that are causing accidents that are killing people? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Here we are, 50 years later, and we're still in the same thing. But his book, and, that, and by the way, General Motors tried to <laughs> railroad him out. They put people on him. Uh, he finally filed suit against General Motors and, and, um, and won lots of money and used the money to fight General Motors more. Um, <laughs> but, but the point was there was, a, there was a push from below. During the year after his book came out, 11 new consumer organizations were formed. Consumer Federation of America began to unite them. And there was a push for more honest labeling of packages. People were saying, the cereal box is getting bigger, the soap box is getting bigger, but it feels lighter. Is it the same amount inside or no? What's going on? So we got more honesty, more truth in labeling. Um, speaking of which, if you go into a grocery store or a drugstore today and you pick up an item and you turn it over and you look on the back to see what's in it and whether or not you want to put it in your mouth or put it on your face or give it to your family, you can thank those people back then because that did not exist until this consumer protest movement took hold. My point is that the push from the bottom, the push from the middle, the push from outside Washington had an impact on how Washington operated and that had an impact on how we lived, okay? And some of that push dealt with taxes and other things. I want to deal with a couple of others first. Environment. This is a state that really values the green and the nature and the Puget Sound and the King Salmon, um, although we have our problems in getting there, but that's what we value. In 1970, Earth Day, April 22nd, 20 million Americans got involved in public protests about the fouling of the air and the waterways in America. Can you imagine that? Almost 10% of the nation's population was out there. In the streets, in shopping malls, at college campuses, on radio, on television, talk of science, you name it. People wearing gas masks, carrying signs, demonstrating. And within a year, Congress passed seven major pieces of environmental legislation. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Anti-Toxic Substance Act, all signed by that great environmentalist Richard Nixon. Well, no, not actually, <laughs> not actually all signed. Uh, one of them wasn't signed. The Clean Water Act was passed over Nixon's, um, Nixon's veto. Uh, now, you have in this city, and maybe even in this hall tonight, I can't see whether or not, Bill Ruckel's house is here, but I, I talked to Bill Ruckel's house about, yeah, he's back here. Um, I talked to Bill about Nixon, and um, I said, Bill, uh, is Nixon really a closet greenie and we just didn't know about? It? He said, Rick, and I hope I'm quoting you right, Bill. He said, I'm taking a chance because the guy's right here. If I'm wrong, <laughs> he's, he's going to tell me. He said, in all the years I worked for him, he said, Bill, he said, he, he never said, Bill, is it really bad out there if you put your arm in the Cuyahoga River, or put your arm in the Potomac River, it comes out covered with green slime or the Cuyahoga River breaking into flames because of all the chemicals uh, tossed into the river by industry. He said, no, he said, but there was one thing that Nixon told me that I remember. He said, when you get over there to that agency, he said, don't let the bureaucrats at EPA capture you. <laughs> you got it, EPA. Brockelshaus <laughs> said, Nixon was the only person in Washington who thought the agency which he had created, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, was nicknamed EPA. And he said, he said, so I said to Bill, I said, so why did he do it? He said he was a practical politician. The people spoke, the people demanded it. You saw them on Earth Day. We had to respond as a government. That's the way government's supposed to work. So there was that kind of interplay that people took for granted happened. Ordinary Americans had a confidence 
that they could exercise people power. They could exercise grassroots civic action. And it would have an impact on public policy. I've already given you several arenas in addition to that. There was a strong labor movement back there. If you go all the way back to the, what is called the Treaty of Detroit, the 1948 agreement between the United Auto Workers Union and General Motors, it set a pattern for not only the auto industry, the steel industry, electronics industry, atomic energy industry, oil industry, rubber industry, all across the board, and lots and lots and lots of non-union companies. And the deal was, Charlie Wilson said at one point, the head of GM said, you know, I want to get back to making cars and making money. And Walter Ruther, the head of the UAW, said, fine, uh, Mr. Wilson, we're game to do that, but we want a, a deal, we want an agreement that says we're going to get paid, we have steady jobs over the life of the agreement, we're going to get paid a little bit more every year, 2-3% every year, um, and we're going to get a health benefit, and we're going to get a retirement lifetime pension, and we're going to make enough money where we can afford to put the down payment down on our house and make the payments for 30 years, and so when we retire, we're going to have a home of our own, we're going to have Social Security, and we're going to have a retirement pension. And listen to these numbers. In 1980... 84% of the people who worked for companies with more than 100 employees had a lifetime pension paid for by the company from the day you retired till the day you died. 70% had a fully paid employer health benefit. And today the number of, uh, of people with a lifetime pension is under 25%. And the number of people with fully paid employer health insurance is under 17%. It's a tremendous change. And those aren't just numbers. Those numbers represent an enormous shift in the cost burden of retirement and health care from the corporate books to the pocketbooks and the checkbooks of individuals. Now, when I started out my book, it wasn't called Who Stole the American Dream? It was called in my contract with my publisher, The Dream at Risk because everybody at that point understood the dream was at risk. Lots of trouble for the American economy. It's only as I began to see the impact of the 401k plan and the housing boom and bust and the way the economy was being managed that I came to the conclusion that, in fact, it didn't just disappear. It was actually taken away. There's been a shift of wealth. Uh, in fact, the wealth shift in the housing sector is the greatest shift of wealth in the history of America. Six trillion dollars. In the late 1980s, American homeowners owned 70% of the value of their own homes, and the banks owned the 30% remaining. By 2008, <coughs> homeowners owned 40% of the value of their homes, and the banks owned 70%. All the refinancing, all the 100% financing, all the second mortgages, all those things, and many of them very bad deals for prime uh, credit risks, not for substandard, not for subprime risk, but for prime risk, shifted 30% of the value of the ownership of the American real estate market from the homeowners to the banks. Six trillion dollars, 30% of 20 trillion dollars, the value of housing in America. So tremendous shifts uh, took place. But back in that early period, there was that sense of security that you had a job, rising pay, and those benefits I mentioned. The other thing that was going on in that time was there was a different concept on the part of the economic leadership, the business leadership of this country. If you read what Charlie Wilson or Reg Jones said at, at, at General Mo uh, Electric or Frank Abrams at ExxonMobil uh, or some of the, the gurus of business schools at that time, Peter Drucker and others, and even the Business Roundtable when it got formed in 1981, they said it was the corporations had a social responsibility. It was the responsibility of the CEO to balance the economic interests of all the stakeholders in the company. Stakeholders, very important word, meaning all the groups that had a stake in the success and survival of that company. Now, people who work for it don't want the company to go out to business. People who supply to it, people who lend it money, people who buy its products, communities where the company has plants, Think of it, Boeing in this state, what a stake this, uh, this state has in the survival and success of Boeing and its continued operation in the state and lots of other employers, not just Boeing, but that's one that's fairly dramatic since there was this thought that maybe Boeing would move a lot of jobs out of here and maybe they are still moving some of those jobs out of here. But my point was that the people in charge of our biggest corporations at that time believed they had to balance the interest. They didn't funnel all their attention just on the shareholders. 
So you had a share the wealth philosophy. They believed it was smart business and smart economics. They thought it was good for the company and good for the country. Charlie Wilson said it, what's good for GM is good for America, what's good for America is good for GM. You do not hear many American corporate leaders saying anything like that today. So just be aware that there's been a mind shift that has had a profound impact on the distribution of the, of the wealth we generate in this country and the way the economic pie is cut up. So those were the things that were really important that had an impact. Of course, we came out of World War II. We were the king of the mountain. We were the only one who had a, an economy that hadn't been devastated by war. Not only our enemies, but our allies uh, were damaged, the British, the French, and later on the Germans, the Japanese. Um, so we were king of the hill. But by the early 60s, they had recovered, and they were beginning to challenge us, and our share of world trade had been cut in half already by the early 1960s by the recovery of these other countries. So I think these other factors, the factor of citizen power affecting public policy and the beliefs of the leadership in our economy were central. Now the next question is, what changed that? Why did it change, and how do we get from there to where we are now? Well, one of the first things that happened was slowly, almost imperceptibly at first, um, but the mindset of those business leaders changed. An economist named Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago, who later won a Nobel Prize, wrote a book called Democracy, uh, Capitalism and Freedom, uh, and in it he said very explicitly, the only mission of the CEO is to maximize the return to shareholders, to deliver the maximum return to shareholders. Well, he cut out all the other stakeholders. If you focus only on the shareholders, then you are going to have disagreements and costs to the workers. Uh, the Boeing uh, case is a particularly interesting one. I mean, you just had this situation where Boeing insisted that to continue to keep working uh, in this state uh, to build the new uh, models of the 777, the workers were going to have to give, uh, not only was the state going to have to give a tremendous write-off on taxes, $8 billion plus, but the workers were going to have to give up their lifetime pensions and accept a 401k plan, costing the workers billions and saving Boeing billions. With difficulty that you know about, that plan was finally accepted, though it was initially rejected. And at the same time, Boeing announced a 50% increase in the dividend of its shareholders and a $15 billion buyback of stock. When the company goes into Wall Street to buy back its own stock, it shrinks the supply that runs the price up. So Boeing had the money to take care of its shareholders, but it didn't have the money to take care of its workers. Now that kind of decision, which reflects shareholder capitalism, it is pure freedmanism, maximum return to shareholders, has caused the growing gap between the middle class and the financial elite in America today. That decision in one form or another, not identical, but very similar, has happened at hundreds of American companies over the last 30 years. And that's why you have this yawning gap. So that change in, in corporate mindset, that change in the notion of what American business is up to and what the obligations of the leadership uh, are, has had a profound impact on the way the economic pie is cut up uh, in America today. The second thing that happened was there was a political revolt in Washington, a revolt that changed the landscape of power and changed the way the government influenced uh, how the economic pie was cut up. Now, amazingly, uh, you may or may not remember this, but amazingly, if you go back to the Eisenhower period and you look at the 1950s, do you know that the maximum marginal tax rate at that time was 92%? 92%. Now, we're told today that if the tax rate went up anywhere near that, nobody would work. Well, my observation was that a lot of people worked. It is somewhat astonishing, maybe, but they did. You know, what that meant was if you were a millionaire and you got paid another million dollars, 920,000 went to the feds, and you got to keep only 80,000. And then it got cut under John F. Kennedy down to 77th percent. During that period of the 1950s and 60s, that 20-year period, the business cycle went up and down, but the average annual growth rate was roughly 3 to 3.1%. If you fast forward to the last decade of the 2000s, the maximum marginal tax rate was reduced to 35% under both Bush and Obama. No difference between the political parties. And the average annual growth rate was less than 1%, and it was less than 1% before the economic downturn of 2008. 
Ladies and gentlemen, there is no connection between how the economy grows and what the maximum marginal tax rate is on individual taxpayers. But the reason why it was so high under Eisenhower and under Kennedy was that there was public pressure to level off the economy somewhat, to take some of the money and redistribute it so it was more fairly distributed among the population as a whole. So this public pressure that I was talking about before, these public movements, had an impact not just on the specific policies of consumers um, and of women and of civil rights, but they also had an impact on the way the government taxed and ran government policy. Minimum wage was regularly increased. Bipartisan votes during that whole period, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, very common. Um, in fact, I, one, of the, one of the major increases occurred under Jerry Ford after he succeeded Nixon. Uh, in fact, there was an effort at that time to index the minimum wage to inflation, uh, which failed. But my point was there was, there, was, there was something happened that caused a policy shift. There was, at the same time that you were having the private sector move towards shareholder capitalism, there was a shift of the power in Washington. And what happened was it was interesting. It's almost like Newton's laws. You know, for every action, there is an opposite, an equal and opposite reaction. The political power that I was talking to you about, the people power, um, of, of the civil rights movement and the consumer movement and the environmental movement and so forth, triggered fears among business leaders that were articulated by a guy named Lewis Powell, whose name may be familiar to many of you. He was a famous co uh, corporate lawyer, a very strong advocate of free enterprise, and he was appointed to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon and began to serve in 1972. But a year earlier, in 1971, Powell was talking to some friends of his at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and they were talking about business being on the defensive, and Powell said, he thought the American free enterprise system was under moral threat. And his friends in the Chamber of Commerce said, well, why don't you write it down? You're used to writing briefs. Write it down. Give us a memo. Powell wrote what is now called the Lewis Powell Memorandum of August 1971. I think it's the most neglected, important document in American history of the last 50 years. In fact, I persuaded Random House to publish it in the paperback of my book. The text of it is in there. I think it's that important. And what Powell said in this memorandum, it, he was a Paul Revere. It was a manifesto to, to corporate America. Get active. Get politically active. You're doing great in the marketplace, but you're getting killed in Congress. You're getting killed in Washington. You have to go in. You have to fight labor in Washington. You have to fight him politically. He specifically condemns the, the women's movement. He condemns Ralph Nader, uh, the consumer movement. He certainly condemns the labor movement. In fact, I think he, he at one point suggests that Walter Ruther, the head of the UAW, is a greater threat to American industry than Soviet communism. So Powell was right alarmed. Uh, and whether or not you agree with his diagnosis, it sounds rather extreme from today's vantage point, it was enormously effective because what happened was business leaders in America responded. And within four months of his letter being circulated privately, those of us in the media, I ran the Washington Bureau of the New York Times at this time, we had no idea, we'd never heard of it. I never heard of Powell's memo until about four years ago, four or five years ago. It got circulated widely. The business roundtable was one of the responses. DuPont and GM and GE and IBM and so forth, the CEOs all got together and said, we need to have uh, uh, an organization to go lobby Washington at the highest levels. The president, the vice president, speaker of the house, majority leader of the Senate, so forth. At the time Powell wrote in 1971, there were only about 175 companies that even had offices in Washington. Hard to believe. Within eight years, this is before Reagan gets elected, before Reagan gets elected, there are 2,425, from 175 to more than 2,400. 50,000 people are working for business trade associations, 9,000 registered, registered, registered corporate lobbyists, excuse me. So there was an army that Powell's memo summoned and then they went to work. What was interesting to me as a reporter, interesting, exciting, a bit embarrassing, was to discover that the biggest change of direction, the most watershed session of Congress, was not when Reagan got elected. It was actually before that, um, when Jimmy Carter was in the White House and the Democrats controlled both houses of the Congress. Uh, and I'll just give you one reason why I said that. The, the legislation was amazing. In 1978 Congress, the 401k plan was written into law, never intended to be a national retirement program. It was written in as a tax shelter for profit sharing bonuses for executives at Kodak and Xerox and a few banks in New York. Think about it. If you had a major reform program, would you call it 401k? 
It's paragraph 401, subparagraph K. It is buried down there, and nobody can see it. It takes quite a while before it becomes what it was. But it gets passed then, and the, and the basis is started. The, the corporate bankruptcy law was changed at that point uh, to the great advantage of management, to the disadvantage of labor. It doesn't start to play out till the 1990s and the 2000s. Uh, there was a law passed uh, under the pressure of the Wall Street banks and the financial part of, the, of Powell's army lobbying to get rid of the ceiling on interest rates. The states had what they called usury laws, which set limits on interest rates. And they got Congress to pass a law that overruled all those usury rates. You could not have had the subprime crisis without that law having been passed. So it got started back then. Deregulation starts in the trucking and the telecommunications industry. It's interesting, Carter comes in. Whenever you want to know how, how politics are going in Washington, there's one thing you really want to watch, tax law. Tax law is all about winners and losers. Tax law is not about anything even. Some people are winning and some people are losing, and how the law gets written tells you how political power is being exercised in Washington. Carter came in, and he thought that there were too many loopholes for the wealthy, and he wanted to close some of the loopholes for the wealthy. He also thought there were some people on the lower end of the income spectrum that should be dropped from the, from the rolls. Um, and he wanted to raise the corporate tax by 2% to help balance the budget. When Congress, under the pressure of Powell's army, got done with that bill, no loopholes on the wealthy were closed. The corporate tax rate didn't go up 2%, it came down 2%. The, the amount is not as significant as the direction, and none of the lower income people were dropped from the rolls, and the capital gains tax, the, which we should call the investment tax, let's be honest about what capital gains are, it's the investment tax. It, got the biggest drop in the last 50 years, from 48% to 28%, all in that same Congress. Now, everybody who invests benefits from a drop in the investment tax, okay? But what you should know is that in recent tax years, more than 50% of the capital gains registered with the IRS are from the top 1% of income earners in the country. So any drop in the, in the capital gains tax or the investment tax rate is to the great benefit of the people at the top. So that was a huge turnaround. I remember talking to Arthur Levitt, who was head of the American Stock Exchange then, a friend of mine at Williams College, a few years ahead of me at Williams College, and I knew him. I said, what's going on, Arthur? He said, well, we've, we've gone into the political arena, and we've discovered that by spending a little bit of money, we can get a lot, and we're going to be back for more. And that's literally what happened. If you move on into the Reagan period, the tax cuts on the top 1% or 2% have added a trillion dollars to the wealth of the top 1% or 2% every decade. That's a trillion dollars in the 1980s, a trillion dollars in the 1990s, a trillion dollars in the 2000s. And the Bush tax cuts of 2001 added another trillion dollars. So you got $4 trillion added to the wealth of the people at the top by the change in the tax policy, which is an outcome of Powell's army going to work and this revolt of the bosses that occurred. Lots of other things happen. Um, some that advantage people at the top and disadvantage people in the middle at the bottom. The payroll tax, the one that, forgive me, Mitt Romney forgot when he was talking about people never paying any taxes. Well, everybody has to pay the payroll tax if they earn anything, okay? So, it went from 3.5% to 7.65% in the same period that the high end of the income tax came down from 92 to 77 to 35. So the, you know, to people who make $150,000 a year or more, the Social Security ca tax, the, capital, the payroll tax is not terribly significant. To, but the families that are making $30,000 or $40,000 a year, that increase, that doubling of that tax is a significant bite on their income. Estate taxes come way down, exemptions go way up, minimum wage doesn't, doesn't rise along with inflation. So you see over a period of 30 or 40 years, public policy, and I could cite lots of other examples, is working to the advantage of financial elite and to the disadvantage of the people in the middle and the bottom. So you have a shift going on in the private sector and it is reinforced by the shift in the, in the public sector and shift of policy. And then what we have now is that money spilling into the political system. And now, quite openly, large amounts of money, billionaires are, once again, this is, this is literally, we're right back to where we were, um, you know, when the, when the initial uh, campaign reform laws were acted in the wake of Watergate. 
when, when money was then being delivered in brown envelopes. Um, and there was an effort to try to control political money. And now we're back into it, and people are quite openly spending enormous amounts of money on both sides, on both sides. But, but you have a phenomenon now, for example, just, just already, I was just reading this the other day in the Washington Post, I do read that other paper, uh, uh, that the Americans for Prosperity, uh, which is basically funded by the Koch brothers, but some other wealthy people as well, has already spent $30 million, I think it's $34 million, on 10 Senate races this year. Now, these are people who come from one state, and they're literally going across the country picking important races to try to influence the total outcome of the Senate. This is not to say there aren't people on the other side who would like to do the same thing. At the moment, there are more Democrats that are vulnerable, and the Democrats have the majority. So there would be people on the other side. But the point is, people with enormous wealth now understand what the gains are from winning power and influence in Washington that, so that they use their, their financial gains to, to gain political power and influence to protect the financial gains and perpetuate and expand this, um, this inequality of income that now grips the country. Um, we're at a terrible pass. People understand this. People, people will say not only are the ratings of the American political parties and the president and the Congress and the media and the lawyers and the Catholic Church and lots of other people of, of, at, at their lows, public confidence in our political system is at one of its low points in the last 40 years, the system as a whole. One of the polls that I read recently said 63% of the people in this country or at least answering that poll, believe America is in decline. It's, that kind of talk got me thinking about some of the history that I read when I went to Oxford after I finished Williams College. I read Arnold Toynbee, the British historian who wrote a study of history, which is a 12-volume history of the 21 civilizations over 6,000 years. I don't want to tell you that I read all 12 volumes. I didn't. <laughs> I, I read an abridged version, which was two volumes, and it was 1,200 pages long, and it was not easy going. Um, <laughs> but it's very interesting what he says, because it's relevant to us today. Toynbee tells the story of human civilization in terms of challenge and response. Every civilization is challenged, and whether or not it survives and grows and thrives and lasts depends upon how well it responds. And he goes all the way back to ancient Inca civilization in Latin America and the Egyptian civilization along the Nile, and he said their biggest challenge initially was a hostile environment. Could they establish an agricultural economy that would support a civilization? And obviously they did, because we can go to Machu Picchu today and see those unbelievable temples or the same thing along the Nile. But they fell victim to another challenge, both those countries, to an outside invader that was militarily more powerful. The Ottoman Turks in the case of the Egyptians, the Spanish in the case of the Incas. Now that's a challenge we're used to in this country. We're used to the idea of, of an external power that's strong, Hitler in World War II, uh, and then of course the Soviet threat for the half century of the Cold War. So we've met that challenge. But what Toynbee talks about next is really important for us. He says that the, the civilizations that we most admired, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, fell victim to something he calls schisms in the soul of the society. Schisms in the body politic, what we would call internal divisions, internal rifts. If you think of what I've been describing to you about the American economy, the American political system, we're two Americas today. We're divided by money, we're divided by power, somewhat divided by philosophy, geography, Wall Street versus Main Street. Washington seems really disconnected from the country. There are lots of divisions here. Our challenge today is really the challenge of whether or not we can meet and overcome the internal divisions among us and begin to forge a way out of the two peak, the, the dead end that we've kind of gotten into in this country. Can it be done? If we, can we recover the middle? Can we help the middle class get back? Um, there are lots of issues we could get into here, but let me just throw out a couple and then we can have a dialogue during the question and answer sessions. You know, there are things that need to be done to bring back the middle economically. Um, we need to create more jobs. Um, and one way we could do it would be to modernize ports like Seattle uh, and Long Beach and, and, and San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, if you go to the Chinese ports, I have. The Chinese skipped a step, and their newest ports are actually much more modern than ours. 
The communication system is more modern than ours. They never bothered to lay telephone wires. They just started in the cell phone era and they just leapt into it. Uh, the bullet trains, if you go to Japan, the bullet trains, I mean, it's unbelievable. You can s set the old glass of water out there and it, it barely wiggles at a, at a train that's going 150, 200 miles an hour. It's just unbelievable railroad system there. We're way behind the world. I mean, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimates we've lost a trillion dollars worth of growth uh, and we're, we're losing more all the time competitively. So we could modernize our transportation system and generate jobs and make ourselves much more competitive. We could invest better in the education of our young people. We're saddling our young people with a trillion dollars at the moment and growing. Trillion dollars in student debt. These kids come out and what do they do? They move home. Even if they get work, they move home. Why? Because they want to pay off that, that debt. They want to get the albatross off their back. They don't want to get married soon. I mean, I've talked to them, and actually, you're going to hear Paul Taylor. He just mentioned Paul Taylor from the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, he's done research on it. He'll talk to you about it more. The kids are putting off getting married. They're putting off starting homes. They're putting off buying cars because they've got this terrible debt. But they're an investment. They're our seed corn. They're our future. If we want our kids to be as smart, we want to have as good engineers and software designers and, and everything else, and we want to have as good health technicians, everything we want, We've got to educate those kids, but not leave them with the debt that we've got. So there's something we could work. We, we need a new GI Bill, I think. The GI Bill, think what the GI Bill did for a whole generation of Americans. It gave them an education. It lifted them. It lifted the country. It, it helped create and strengthen the middle class in this country, the GI Bill. So there's a couple of ideas. I happen to think we need to raise the minimum wage. It's a big issue here. I'll let you guys get into it with me. You know, you know more about what's going on here, but it's absolutely critical. I mean, this, the idea, and, and it's not so bad in Washington because you're already a couple of dollars above the federal minimum wage, but the idea that people work full time in America and they come out and they're living at a poverty level, they qualify for food stamps, that means we as taxpayers are subsidizing the employers that are not paying them enough so that they, you know, that they can. <laughs> but it isn't, just, it isn't just a question of whose interest, one interest versus the other. More people making more money is more purchasing power. That's what drives the American economy. The secret to the growth back in that period I was talking to you about before in the 50s, 60s, and 70s versus now is the middle class was paid better. And they went out and they spent their money. Middle class Americans don't save a lot of money. They, they, put, they buy their mortgage and they start paying for their house and that's it. They spend 95% of their cash in good times and 105% in bad times. You know? and, and that's what drives the economy. You get more of that demand, you get, you get more production, you get people building more factories, hiring more workers, buying more equipment. Economists call that the virtuous circle of growth because each part of the circle pushes the other part. And we've broken that cycle. We've knocked that out of kilter. That's one reason why, you know, here we are, where are we? We're, we're just about five years into the recovery. And we have no idea when we're going to get unemployment down to the same level it was at when we went into it. Janet Yellen said the other day, the head of the Fed said, she expected it would be another two years. That's, you know, that's seven years from the bottom to back. It used to take us less than two years. Then it took us more than three years. Then it took us more than four. Each recovery since 1990 has taken us longer. There's something structurally wrong. And what's structurally wrong is the middle class is not getting a big enough share of the returns because too much is going to the top. It's not just a matter of it's being unfair. It's not smart economics. There are lots of good economic studies out that show that when, when there's less inequality of income, growth is better. That high inequality of income is destructive to growth. And it, there are people who've studied periods in American history, there are people who've studied other economies, uh, and there's lots of evidence there. So there are things we need to do there. But in the economy, I don't think we're gonna get to Washington anyway, solving these problems, until we can deal with the political issues. We've gotta get a grip on the big money in politics. We, in the first place, we've gotta understand it. We've now got new methods of passing money around uh, in, in the political system with these independent spending groups where we can't follow it anymore. We don't know whose money is going to whom unless people step out and say, the Koch brothers are pretty proud about it, they say it, but they're actually putting it into an institution that under the law, they don't have to admit that they're putting it in. And there are lots of other wealthy people that are giving to the same organization, Americans for Prosperity, and they're not revealing who they are. So when the money then flows from there to the candidates or to the parties, we don't know where it's coming from. We can't track it. Uh, and then you've got the decisions we've had, Citizens United, uh, and now we've had the McCutcheon decision, People are now starting to say, wait a second. I mean, when the founding fathers wrote the Bill of Rights, were they talking about free speech or a free flow of money? 
Are speech and money the same thing or not? Are people who, who breathe, bleed, and bear children, are they the same as corporations or unions or universities or inanimate institutions? And don't we need to do something about it? Now, there are 16 states that have already taken action to try to reverse Citizens United. So that's another issue. There's gerrymandering. It's a big issue around this country. Maybe not as big an issue in this state, but it's huge. 90% of the districts for the House of Representatives now have safe districts. We're a nation that believes in competition. Our two political parties have taken the competition out of 90% of the districts for the House. There's sort of no way in which the, the people can have an impact and send a message to Washington very effectively now, the way the gerrymandering has been done. And you know, Washington State's done some things that, are, that you should be, we should be very proud of. I mean, I think the, the, the single primary, this open primary, where everybody votes in the same primary, where all the candidates run in the same primary, it pushes politicians to appeal to the center and not just to the extremes, to appeal across party lines. It begins to create politicians who are motivated to compromise, and we need compromise uh, to make the American system work. So there's a lot of work to be done, and I think it's not going to get done unless we get back to that idea of people power that I was talking about before. We, the people, have got to figure out the issues that are important to us here at home in Washington State, or in Illinois, or in New Hampshire, or in Florida, or wherever, and then go to work on them and begin to exert our power. Because at the moment, people say government's not working, but in fact it is working. It's working for the people who are paying for it to work for them. So we've got to put the pressure on the government so it works for us and get back to government of the people, by the people, for the people. Thank you. I really appreciate your presentation. I would like to know what's the best, most effective, and practical way we can make a difference. What do we really need to do? He was asking, what's the most practical thing you can do? Well, right at the moment, if this issue concerns you, there, is now, there are now petitions circulated in Washington State calling for putting on the ballot in November an issue, an initiative calling for the reversal of Citizens United decision. So that if, if, if that concerns you, frankly, it concerns me, that would be something that you could work for. You could uh, circulate petitions, uh, and, and you could do something about that, and then, and then work for it to get it passed. I think that's very important. Uh, oh, my God. I, I, I can tell you, walking in here, there were people outside, and one of them is inside. I, 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 I want to I make it clear. I came here ready to say that without their being here. <laughs> I signed one. You signed one. Okay, well, you can do that. But then, then take it, and, you know, there's another thing. There are a lot of people in this room, and, and I want to be careful about not having to guess your age, but there are a lot of people in this room who can remember personally the movements I'm talking about. Civil rights, women's, and I see a lot of heads nodding. We remember it. We either were involved or we knew people were involved or we lived at a time which was close enough so that's part of our memory. It's not part of the knowledge of the millennial generation. They don't know that. So one of the most important things you can do is to talk to younger people in your own families, in your communities, in your church, in your business, wherever you meet with them. And sit down and take some time to talk about the things I'm talking about here. I wouldn't be unhappy if you decided to actually get a hold of a copy of my book because I got a bit of that written up there and you've got a copy. <laughs> Fantastic. You're way, I like people like that. You're way ahead of me. But, but whether it is my book or somebody else's, it's important for the younger people to understand that people power in this country has mattered. And it's and it, within our memories. And it's not un American. It's doable. Because they got to be persuaded that they can get involved. And, and there may be a very good partnership that we could form between our generation and theirs. And if the baby boomers in between don't get it, all right, we'll talk to the younger guys. <laughs> I, I'm being funny about it, but I'm also being serious. I, I think it's very important for us to share our own knowledge of history and our own history and our own experience and let people know that it isn't just nostalgia. It isn't just old folks saying when we were young, everything was above average. I mean, I made fun of that deliberately. It was different then, and it was different because ideas matter. The idea, that you, the idea that you share the wealth 
and everybody benefits from that is a very important idea, and it was central to the success of this country. And we've lost that idea. It's become competitive. It's become a, a, a win-win situation. Either, I'm not a win-win situation. It's, it's a win-lose situation. It's become, if I get more, you get less. Or if you get more, I get less. And so I'm against you. And actually, we built a larger, we made a larger pie by working together. And we've lost a lot of that spirit. We need to get it back. And we in the older generation have an opportunity to share that with others. So there's specific things you can do. You can work for the minimum wage. You can work on the, on the Citizens United thing. You can work on gerrymandering. You can work, uh, uh, work for, uh, here's one. What if corporations, when they want to make political donations, before we get this, the, the constitutional amendment, what if they had to actually get a vote from their shareholders? They're supposedly acting in the name of their shareholders. Why should it be required that for a corporation, just the same thing for a union, if they're going to go spend the money in a political way, why should they have to get the vote of their members or their shareholders? It'd be a lot less spent because it takes a long time to get those votes. <laughs> I, I'm being funny, but I'm also being serious. I mean, that's the idea of accountability. That's the idea of democracy, that you don't have elites running around deciding to do things for ev in everybody's name, but in their own personal self-interest. Yes, over here. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about a recent book that's become quite um, popular and much discussed. It was um, uh, by a French economist, um, Thomas Piketty, I think. Thomas Piketty. And, and Piketty, okay, thank you. And I, it, yep. was, uh, it was it, part of the discussion included Bill Moyer's interview with Paul Krugman this past weekend. Yeah. So I, I could say a lot, but I won't. I'd just like to know if you've read it and w whether his conclusions and his analysis right. are consistent with what you've been discussing. Yes, with us there's tonight. no question. Well, I should be honest, uh, product, honest in product labeling. Um, I've read Piketty and a guy named Emmanuel Saiz, who's an economist at Berkeley, who've been doing income studies for a long time. And a lot of the numbers that I've cited include that number, 84% of the gains in, uh, of the whole nation in the last, uh, from 79 to 2011, it comes from Piketty and Saiz's studies. Okay, So what, what Piketty has done in this latest book, he's gone beyond the income studies to suggest uh, and to argue that the evidence shows that that it is inevitable, unless we intervene politically, uh, that the capitalist system will drive towards higher inequalities of income because what, when he went back and he studied the history of the United States and several countries in Europe, he found that the rate of return to what are called rents, what economists call rents, is the rate of return to capital, investment income, capital gains is what I was just talking about. When the rate of return is higher than the rate of growth, then the people who are investing money, making their money with money, not with labor, their share is going to keep growing. And what he said is the history shows over the last couple of hundred years that in fact the return to investments is about 5% and the, and the national growth rates is about 3%. So what he's saying is it's inevitable unless we intervene and do something about it. And the period that I was talking about to you the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, Piketty says, was an unusual period because of the way well, he doesn't go into it the same way I do. He's an economist, and I'm more operating more as a historian or political scientist. He doesn't go into all the popular movements, but what he was saying is you had a different political climate uh, in, that, in that period, and also after the war, capital was exhausted. You know, so many things have been destroyed that we needed more capital, and so the return wasn't so great for capital. But he's making the argument that, that, that we're, in a, we're in a cycle that we can't break unless we intervene politically. That the tendency of capitalism is to grow towards larger and larger institutions and more and more profits accumulate at the top. And he says that unless we do something about it uh, in the ways that I've been suggesting, that the inequality is gonna grow. At the moment, the 1%, top 1% is now garnering about 23% of the income every year in the nation. And he's saying it's going to go right on up, well above that. We're not at a record level. In 1929, it was 24%. But we're practically at the record level in our own history. So he's saying economically, this is, this is a, he doesn't call it an iron law, but he calls it a law of motion of capitalism. That's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you've been talking about money. And you've been talking about what is. 
and I have no compl no grudge about that, but why are you missing the major elephant in the room, which is climate change? We're not even going to be able to survive very long. Our children aren't going to be able to breathe without clean air or, with, or without drinking clean water, and we just keep fracking and, and sticking everything, you know, just whatever we makes more money is fine, and I don't understand why you're not concern with your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. I am. That's another issue. It's another book. But let me make the point. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I mean, I agree with you. It's a major issue. And uh, you know, there's just so much I can do. Um, uh, and there are other people who know a lot more than I am that are telling me even more than you're telling me. But I do want to make this point. No matter what you think about that issue, you're not going to get anywhere unless you fix the political system because you cannot address any significant issue in America today with the kind of deadlock we have. And the kind of deadlock we have is now built in, we have a systemic problem. One of our problems in America is we're such believers in individualism that we assume that every individual is capable of taking care of himself or herself and yeah. solving every problem. We are past that point now. We have economic problems that are systemic, we have environmental problems that are systemic, and we have political problems that are systemic. We can only get out of the jam we're in if we can come together and begin to deal with the system. And my conclusion uh, from being a Washington reporter for at least four decades and probably five, uh, which is more than I want to admit, um, is, that, is that we're not going to deal with that issue, which is your number one issue, and it's a fine issue or the debt, which is somebody else's number one issue, or kids' education, which is somebody else's number one issue, or modernizing our ports and being more globally competitive, which is other people's issue. We're not going to be able to deal with any of those issues until we fix the political system. So I'm, I'm hallelujah to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not putting your issue down. Uh, it's part of the mess that we're in.